Um, today, we have Sarah Morgan. Sarah has a bachelor's degree in history and a passion for the First Ladies. In 2019, she began a project on Instagram, Cooking with the First Ladies. You can check her Instagram out. Her Instagram is amazing. Now she also creates content for the National First Ladies Library, doing videos to share the content, including food facts, um, tutori tutorials, and recipes. For today's session, we are so honored to have her with us, and she will talk about Grace Coolidge's life at, at Grace Coolidge um, has been so, um, not, um, was so influential and was one of the most important first ladies in the United States. So now Sarah will also teach us how to make Grace Coolidge's favorite cocktail. So join us and um, welcome Sarah. And now is your show. Thank you, Sarah, for doing this. Thank you guys for having me. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Um, and so um, again, thanks so much for asking me to be a little part of your cool uh, Explore Culture um, experience here. So um, I, um, like Floyd was saying, I, I actually, I found uh, the First Lady's uh, cookbook um, at a thrift store, actually, um, and decided to cook my way through all of the first ladies. Um, and uh, so it's kind of turned into this. Um, and it's been a really fun project. Um, so um, I'm going to step over here and share my screen um, and do a, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation um, about Grace Coolidge and the Roaring Twenties as well. Um, and then uh, we'll make our cocktail. Um, so I hope you all enjoy. Okay, uh, so Grace has been described as a glamorous, elegant, outgoing, and friendly, um, just a loving wife and mother, dynamic, energetic, young, vibrant, witty, with a loud laugh, and stylish. Um, in many ways, uh, she was actually the complete opposite of her husband, who was known as Silent Cow. Uh, and she balanced her husband's manner with her kind nature and vivaciousness. Uh, Grace was also very modest and once said, it has been my experience that those who are truly great are the most simple people at heart, the most considerate and understanding with a decided aversion of talking about themselves. Uh, she really followed this well because she never spoke to reporters, which also added to her mysterious quality. Uh, the 1920s were known most famously as the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age, and the Coolidge administration happened right alongside it. As many countries around the world were experiencing economic prosperity following the end of World War I, the decade brought about several new and exciting social and cultural trends. Uh, jazz blossomed, Art Deco peaked, and the Charleston made its dancing debut. For women, knee-length skirts and dresses became acceptable, bobbed hair with the Marcel wave was the bee's knees, and they were smoking and drinking out of porcelain teacups in the speakeasies. Uh, these ladies who pioneered these trends were known as flappers, and Zelda Fitzgerald is often known as the first. Her husband, F. Scott Fitzgerald, described in his 1920s book, The Great Gatsby, uh, by writing, the parties were bigger, the, past, the pace was faster, the shows were broader, the buildings were higher, the morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. Before uh, the Golden Twenties, Grace Anna Goodhue was born in Vermont on January 3rd, 1879, and was an only child. Uh, she received um, an excellent education, including piano lessons and exposure to fine music. She also was a very lively and friendly child who had an active social life, which reflected her personality as first lady and as a hostess. 
Calvin Coolidge uh, lived across the street after she graduated college, and she used to see him in his window shaving with a derby hat on the back of his head and wearing long underwear. There are varying accounts of exactly how they met, but regardless, began writing letters in 1904 and were married in 1905. Grace's mother initially opposed the timing of the wedding because she wanted the couple to wait until Grace had learned to bake bread. But Calvin actually responded by saying, I can buy bread at the store. Uh, Grace Coolidge and Calvin both enjoyed poetry and was one of their first bonds. Uh, the first poem that Grace granted permission to set to music was titled The Quest. It played on the radio in 1930 and it goes, crossing the uplands of time, skirting the borders of night, scaling the face of the peak of dreams, we enter the region of light and hastening on with eager intent, arrive at the rainbow's end. And there uncover the pot of gold buried deep in the heart of a friend. Uh, they lived very simply at the beginning of their marriage and quickly had two sons. Grace once said of their early married life, what matters these trappings if love is strong and life is sweet? Uh, this changed very quickly when he was elected vice president alongside Warren Harding, where they moved to DC, lived at the Hotel Willard, and she quickly became the most popular woman in Washington. Uh, Grace was such an animal lover that she found a family of mice in their suite during their time living at the hotel. And instead of getting rid of them, she fed them crackers. She began presiding over um, the ladies of the Senate, and many said that she had natural charm, and although she was amused by all the social functions, uh, she was very natural and generally unimpressed, but in a fun and casual way. Even when she became First Lady, the social events and functions were just as Calvin, as well as herself, wanted, unpretentious and dignified. Uh, Coco, Coco Chanel is credited with being the fashion icon of the 20s, influencing the shorter hairstyles, and her little black dress was described by Vogue as Chanel's Ford, as it was as popular and available as Henry Ford's cars. Grace exemplified the flapper style with her sporty thin frame that worked perfectly with the straight low-waisted dresses and she usually wore bright colors. Grace rode the Vogue wave of the time with her fashionable clothes and was even awarded a gold medal from the French government for furthering the modern fashion industry. Even though Cal was very frugal and also disliked progressiveness, especially with clothing and hairstyles, uh, and he did prevent her from wearing pants even on her daily hikes and walks or bobbing her hair, he did buy her uh, some of the most expensive fashions. The era saw a boom in automobiles, telephones, motion pictures, radio, and household electricity, in addition to the significant changes in lifestyle and culture, um, and it really shaped pop culture as we know it today. Grace Coolidge remembers as a young girl getting steam heat and electricity installed in their home, which made life so much easier. The Coolidges also were the first couple to light the community Christmas tree by pushing a button to activate the lights since electricity was still new, even in the 20s. Uh, the media began to focus on celebrities, especially sports heroes and movie stars as the talkies took over the silent films. In fact, Grace was also the first first lady uh, to speak in sound newsreels. Grace Coolidge was a movie buff and she invited several different vaudeville stars, screen actors and recording artists to visit the White House. She also attended performances by Groucho Marx and purchased and used her own handheld moving picture camera. Newsreels also captured Grace at their vacation home in the Black Hills of South Dakota, wearing her sporty mountain gear. Um, so now I'm gonna show just a short newsreel clip of Grace uh, Coolidge with the Girl Scouts. In middle 1920s, Grace Coolidge is first lady of the land and honorary member of the Scouts. Here on White House lawn, she tries Girl Scout cakes and finds that scouting has sure taught the troopers how to cook a cookie. In 1925, at Roslyn, Virginia, Mrs. Calvin Coolidge again officiates, this time to award prizes to leading Scouts and troops. 
With her are founder Juliet Lowe and Mrs. Herbert Hoover, all three of them dressed in the latest Girl Scout fashion of the day. Um, in addition to actors, uh, she also hosted Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator who completed the first nonstop solo flight from New York to Paris in his plane, The Spirit of St. Louis, in June 1927 at the White House, and the party became one of her most famous events. Um, unfortunately, even though Charles offered to take her on a flight around D.C., Calvin refused to allow her to do it because he thought it would be too much of an unnecessary public scene. Uh, large baseball stadiums were built in major U.S. cities in addition to palatial cinemas. Grace, a lifelong baseball fan who also taught the game to her sons while her husband was away in Boston due to his growing political career, was known as the first lady of baseball and was a huge Red Sox fan. Uh, she also said, you might not give a hoot about baseball, but for me, it's my very life. As first lady, she attended the Washington Nationals home games, enjoyed a front row seat at the 1925 World Series, and was given a yearly season pass from the American League in a fitting and fancy gold trimmed purse. Uh, Grace would even tune into games on her personal crystal radio set with headphones and would visit the White House Telegraph Room as well to keep updated on scores. Uh, in addition to baseball, she embraced the new technologies in general and listened to programs on her radio every morning. Uh, one of the most important historical events occurring during this time was Prohibition. Uh, Grace ironically named one of her dogs Rob Roy after a popular cocktail during the Prohibition years. Um, okay, so I'm going to pause this for just a second and we're going to make our cocktail. make our Rob Roy, um, you're going to need um, some scotch whiskey, um, and I'm using uh, Johnny Walker, um, some uh, bitters, um, which you can use any variety of those that you want, um, as well as sweet vermouth um, and either orange or lemon, and today I'm going to be using orange. Um, so I'm going to grab a little bit of ice, and if y'all want to grab a little bit of ice too. You'll just get a little bit of ice there. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to take two ounces of your uh, scotch whiskey. So what's ounces in spoonful? Is it two tablespoons? Do you know? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, am, I am putting it in the chat. I am doing it soon. Um, right. It's 60 okay. mil, 60 ml. 16 ml, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know. Um, so two ounces or uh, whatever it is in the chat there, um, as well as then one ounce of your sweet vermouth. And if you're making, I'll just give you a second there to get that done. Because I, I don't know yeah. conversion things very well in regards to cooking. But, <laughs> um, so it's 30 ml vermouth. 30 ml vermouth. Vermouth. Right. All and, right. And then just about one to two, maybe three dashes of your bitters. Okay. Done. Then I'm going to get my orange. Yeah, you can use either an orange or a lemon. I like the orange personally. Mm. I like orange too. Um, and also with your orange, um, if you're interested in making a little garnish, 
Um, you can um, slice off a little bit of the peel and then just make a little orange twist here. Okay. As a little garnish. Mm -hmm. And once you've added all of this, then you're just gonna wanna take uh, the orange and just give yourself a little bit of a squeeze. And then um, you're just gonna either, if you have a shaker, which I don't have one, you can either, if you're doing this in your shaker, you can shake it, or if you're doing it um, like this, just uh, stir it for about 20 seconds is what they kind of recommend. have Sabina and Walker who made cocktail with you. So that's awesome. Um, so um, Rob Roy, um, her dog, um, frequently appeared with Grace at public events and became the first dog to be part of an official first family portrait in 1924. Uh, because the dog was uh, so much a part of the family, the first lady insisted on having him pose with her for the official White House portrait in 1924. Uh, when she debated wearing a red dress against a blue background, Cal, known for his dry sense of humor, suggested she could also achieve a red, white, and blue theme by wearing a white dress and dyeing the dog red. Uh, Calvin, an animal lover as well, once said, any man who does not like dogs and want them about does not deserve to be in the White House. Uh, the striking, famous portrait was presented to her by her Pi Phi sorority sisters. Um, the mo uh, in addition to her two collies, uh, the other named Prudence Prim, the Coolidges also had a literal zoo at the White House, which was known by the press as the Pennsylvania Avenue Zoo. Uh, the Coolidge's variety of animals included cats, dogs, and birds, one of which, her unnamed mockingbird, she had to give up because it was actually illegal to own in D.C., and she did not think it would be appropriate for the first lady to go to jail since the penalty was up to a month in prison and a $5 fine. Uh, the most famous of these animals was a raccoon, which she named Rebecca. Uh, the raccoon had been sent from a couple in Mississippi as a gift to be eating, eaten for Thanksgiving dinner, but neither of the Coolidge's wanted to eat it. So that year, the raccoon received a presidential pardon, just like the traditional turkey. Uh, Grace often showed off the raccoon and would walk it around on a leash. And in fact, the raccoon would often sleep on the president's lap in the evenings. Uh, she was given a special Christmas present one year, which was a collar with a shiny plate that was engraved, Rebecca Raccoon of the White House. However, the thoughts Rebecca had when Grace gave a raccoon fur coat to her son was never recorded. Um, Rebecca caused a lot of mayhem at the White House and was known as a regular Houdini, escaping from cages, her harness, and also tearing up furniture and clothes. Uh, the chaos continued when they felt she was becoming lonely and decided to get her a mate who they named Reuben. In the end, however, both raccoons were given to the National Zoo at Rock Creek Park. 
Uh, these will most likely be the last raccoon pets at the White House because it's now illegal to own them in DC. Uh, the raccoon was not the first time people sent the Coolidge's animals that had not necessarily been asked for. They were also gifted a black haired bear, an African pygmy hippo, a pair of lion cubs, which Calvin named Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. Um, another important historical event was the passing of the 19th Amendment, given, giving women the right to vote in August of 1920. Even though Grace was in mourning after the sudden passing of her youngest son, Calvin Jr., she made a spectacle of completing her absentee ballot for reporters in 1924, voting in only the second presidential election in which women were eligible to vote. It also was one of her qualities that captivated her to the American public because she never let her grief get in the way of her duties and showed courage and strength even in a time of personal struggle. She eventually wrote the poem, Open Door, about the tragic death of her son. And on the fifth anniversary of his death, it was published in Good Housekeeping Magazine, which she continued to submit poems to throughout her life. Uh, the 1920s were also the era of the new woman when women began to challenge the, as they would say, old hat norms controlling their behavior, appearance, and cultural roles. And Grace embodied just about all of these fads with her love of baseball, her on-point style, and her embrace of pop culture, even despite her restrictions and regulations as first lady. Uh, she became a role model for young women because of her sense of fashion and independence. Uh, although Calvin did not uh, support her speaking vocally on politics, she used her quiet support of issues that were important to her by attending budget meetings as well as Senate hearings to silently show her interests. Uh, even with her lack of public speeches on these topics, her visible support on issues such as women's suffrage and education, uh, child welfare and healthcare brought the national attention. Her most passionate issue was for the deaf and disabled. <clears throat> For a time after her father was injured at work, she was sent to live with the Yale family and they introduced her to children with hearing impairments. After she graduated from the University of Vermont with her teaching degree, um, she was actually the first first lady to graduate with a four year undergraduate degree, uh, where she was also the founding member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority um, and she continued to be a part of that for her whole life. Um, she and her sisters uh, vowed to write round robin letters, which future historians have used to see their lives and their interests. Um, because she became a college educated first lady, her ideas were valued by many. After graduation, Grace decided to take lip reading classes and teach at the Clark School for the Deaf. Um, and there she actually taught lip reading instead of sign language. Uh, this passion continued throughout her life and into her time as first lady. She not only ended up raising $2 million for the school, which Calvin supported as well by asking his wealthy donors to contribute as a way to commemorate his time in Washington, uh, but also invited the disabled and hearing impaired to the White House. Uh, the most notable uh, was Helen Keller, uh, which can be seen in silent newsreel footage using her hands to feel Grace's face and to read her lips. This brought a lot of public awareness to those with not only hearing disabilities, but also uh, blindness and sight impairments. After Warren Harding's sudden death and on her first day as first lady, she said, this was I and yet not I, this was the wife of the president of the United States and she took precedence over me, my personal likes and dislikes must be subordinated to the consideration of those things which were required of her. Grace's time as first lady was just as roaring as the decade. It very much, uh, and it very much changed and expanded the duties of future first ladies who would serve in the role. Uh, she participated in many public events, such as planting trees, hosting garden parties, accepting May Day baskets, and continuing the tradition started by Edith Wilson and Florence Harding of being honorary president of the Girl Scouts. She also had the honor of pressing the ceremonial button at the 1925 World's Fair. She was photographed often participating in these activities and was extremely popular with the public. Another highlight of her time as First Lady was in January of 1928, when she became only the third First Lady to travel outside the United States during her incumbency when she went to Cuba. 
Grace also spent some of her tenure renovating the White House due to her interest in American history and antiques. She was uh, extremely interested in the antiques and used her visual skills to revamp the property. She was very disappointed in the lack of original antiques of former first families and actually went on a hunt to find some. Uh, she also created a crocheted coverlet for the Lincoln bed and left it to become part of the permanent collection, which also started a tradition of first ladies leaving a memento for future residents. In fact, Grace is one of the first ladies, uh, first first ladies to have claimed to see Lincoln's ghost in what was his old office looking out the window. Uh, one of her lasting legacies was creating the idea to form a committee of antique and design experts to advise on the furnishings in the White House. And during her time, the green room was the first room in the White House to be fully furnished with mostly American antiques. The renovations included uh, securing the roof and ceiling of the second story, as well as adding a beautiful sky parlor on the third floor. Uh, it was fitting she wanted to add the parlor for more sunlight as her nickname given by the Secret Service was Sunshine because of her bright personality. Uh, after Calvin decided not to run for a second term in office, they purchased a home called The Beaches in Northampton. After Calvin's death in 1933, she continued to focus not only on raising money and awareness for the hearing impaired and the Clark School for the Deaf, but also the Red Cross and local charity work. In 1939, she raised money to bring Jewish refugee children to the United States from Germany and also for the Dutch victims of the Nazis during World War II. She also loaned her home to the Waves and put most of her furniture up for auction in order to donate her money to the Red Cross. Uh, she was very supportive of the United Nations after World War II and posed for a photo signing her pledge in support of the organization. In addition to her charity work, she spent most of her time with uh, her son and his family. Uh, Grace also took on new adventures. In 1934, she disguised herself with glasses and took one of her uh, one and only trips back to Washington as a tourist and was able to go undetected. Uh, she also went on her first airplane ride and learned to drive a car, both of which Calvin had never supported. She ended up taking her first trip to Europe, uh, which she used her new driving abilities to take an auto tour with a friend through the country in 1936. She also began an autobiography after she realized there was a lack of recorded history um, of the First Lady's lives in and out of the White House, which concluded with the end of her tenure in 1929. It was originally published in a series of two American magazine articles, and then over 50 years later was published in full. She also submitted poems to Good Housekeeping magazine and even started appearing in newsreels, but also talking in sound recordings. Uh, now, even though Grace had so many amazing attributes and lived such a literal roaring life, she considered herself hopeless in the kitchen. Um, so the recipes um, that I made um, for uh, the National First Ladies Live program um, were mostly credited to her, um, most likely, um, especially with the coffee souffle recipe came from her housekeeper. Um, so some of the other foods that they considered to be the bee's knees uh, back in the 1920s uh, were flapjacks, codfish cakes, mushroom toast, and Hoover stew. Uh, which was named after President Hoover. Uh, now Hoover stew was just basically macaroni and cheese with sliced hot dogs. Uh, foods, especially Chinese as well as Italian, uh, were kind of seen as exotic during the 20s, became really popular. Uh, prohibition also affected food trends uh, during the 20s because many recipes started to leave out liquor from the recipes and replace it with alternatives such as vanilla extract. Uh, the 1920s saw a spike in the sweet tooths uh, which translated to fruit cocktails, pineapple upside down cake, and jello molds, as well as tea sandwiches, fancy salads such as Waldorf, um, and the like. Uh, the 20s also started modern vegetarianism, and peanuts were promoted as healthy alternatives to animal meat. Uh, culinary experimentation with pickles, olives, and relishes boomed. Uh, although during the 20s, ingredients were still measured in pinches, dashes, and dibs, uh, of course, most people use just a little bit more accurate measurements today.
So that's most of what I have for you today. I do have one other kind of neat story um, about the 1920s, and I'm going to try to demonstrate it today, but it's starting to get a little light outside. So when I hit these lights, I'm hoping that this will show up. But um, one of the stories that I really um, like from the 1920s um, is about the radium girls. Um, in the early, uh, late 1800s, um, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie uh, discovered radium. Um, and they used to call it, um, you know, this shining little light because it, it glowed. Um, so in the United States, they began using that, the United States Radium Company, um, to paint on the watch face dials um, and the airplane dials um, for soldiers, especially in, uh, there in World War I prior to um, the 1920s. Um, and most of the people that were employed there were all women, really young women, uh, especially. They felt really lucky to be employed by United States Radium uh, because not only were they paid very well, uh, but Radium was seen as a really beneficial health product. It was put in toothpastes, um, different lotions and skin products. And it was also very expensive in order to purchase that, especially the tonics and whatnot. Um, so they felt very lucky um, to be able to work around it. So what they were doing um, was called lip pointing. Um, so they would take what they called undark, which was radium uh, mixed with different powders to make the paint. And they would dip their paintbrush um, into the paint, lip point it, and then paint tiny little numbers on the watch faces. Um, so even though at the time they thought this was good for you, um, obviously we all know that you don't want to be licking on radium. Um, so unfortunately, many of these women were very sick, um, passed away, and they very painful deaths. Sometimes their jaws would literally just detach and fall out. Um, bones were very brittle. Um, and unfortunately, the radium company at the time said, you know, we're not going to help take care of this for you. Um, and they would actually lie and put it on their death certificates that it was different things such as syphilis in order to cover up that radium possibly was dangerous. Um, so um, eventually, um, the women did get some justification and some um, Legal battles were won, and that actually is what led to workplace safety uh, protocols and whatnot here in the United States. Um, so, of course, they banned doing that. Um, some of the other benefits that came out of that, however, though, um, was um, one of the byproducts of ra radium is uranium, um, and they used that to complete the Manhattan Project, um, which actually um, was here in Tennessee as well. Um, we had a, a factory here that um, was assisted in the um, unfortunate making of the atomic bomb. But um, anyway, uh, they uh, also, uh, one of the popular things in the 1920s was what they called Vaseline glass. Um, so if anybody's ever seen Vaseline glass, it's this really pretty green glass, but it actually has uh, uranium in it. Um, so although it's not dangerous, you probably don't want to, you know, if you ever come across this at the store, um, it does glow under a black light. Um, so if you'll just give me one second, I'm going to hit the lights really quick and I'm going to try to see if I can show you how it glows. So one second. Wow. Can you kind of tell that it's glowing? Yeah. And then um, I also have a, um, this is a, it's a marble mm -hmm. that also has the uranium in it. Wow. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> it is cool. All right, well, um, that's really all I had um, for today. Um, a few of other Grace Coolidge's uh, favorite recipes, um, which um, if you're interested, I could share and you can send those out maybe in an email if anybody wants to try making them, um, is a coffee souffle, um, as well as icebox cookies. Um, and then kind of the most unique one, in my opinion, which it's 
super easy to make, but it's called a pineapple salad. And it's basically pineapple sliced in half. You put pineapple and cream cheese and strawberries on top. And it's really pretty, but um, it's super simple to make. Um, so I can, I can send those um, to you if you'd like to uh, send them out if anybody's interested in making some of those fun 1920s dishes. But um, like I said at the beginning, um, at Cooking with the First Ladies is my Instagram. Um, and um, if you are interested in the First Ladies or learning more about it, um, National First Ladies Library, um, their YouTube and socials um, have a lot of additional content, not just mine. Um, and at the end of next month, um, at the end of April, um, I'll be doing a live program talking about former First Lady Rosalind Carter um, and cooking some of her favorite recipes, um, which again is over on the National First Ladies Library. Yes, and you also have um, the same class with all the food that you were you were just talking about um, at CCAE. So I think that we probably can give a couple of the tickets um, so that um, if you want to learn how to make pineapple salad, um, coffee souffle, um, icebox cake, and Rob Roy again, so um, we can probably give you a couple of the tickets to, to take the class and make those delicious food. So um, Sarah, thank you very much. We have a couple of the questions from our audience. Um, why did you become so interested in the first ladies? Um, that's a good question. Um, honestly, finding the, the book here um, at the thrift store, I just, I went to school for history. I just, I have a super passion for history. Um, but when I came across it, I just thought that that's fun. That's really cool. And actually it was my husband who influenced me. He said, you know, oh my gosh, you should cook your way through that sort of like the uh, Julia and Julia um movie and the girl who did the blog, he, you know, said that would be really fun and he likes to eat. Um, so it, really that kind of spawned it. And then from there, it's, I've kind of learned more about some of these ladies and also about their time and whatnot. And, um, and now it's just turned into this. So, <laughs> but I hope that's a good answer for that. That's great. Thank you. Also, um, we what? Who is your favorite, most favorite first lady? This is a tough question. It is tough. Um, originally, I would I would always say um, Jacqueline Kennedy, which I'm sure she's a favorite of just about everybody. Um, so, but then ironically, um, when I was asked to do the live program for the first ladies library, um, I chose Grace Coolidge because the 1920s are my favorite kind of one of my favorite time periods um, to research. Um, so actually I would have to say that she's become one of my favorite, but it's a toss up between those two. But um, so many of them are so fascinating. It's really hard to pick one, but I'd have to say either Grace Coolidge or Jacqueline Kennedy. Ah, that's great. I think we are sure that you probably have been cooking a lot of first ladies of food and drinks. What is your most favorite drink and what is your most favorite food out of the food that you have been researching and cooking with the first lady? Um, That's tough, I know. <laughs> hard. Um, I can also share what the worst is if anybody's interested. But my favorite, um, I'd say one of my top favorite, and we're going back to Jackie, um, is uh, she had a beef stroganoff recipe and really honestly it's been one of our our favorites and one that um, both my husband and my daughter requests to make you, you know can you make that beef stroganoff again you know so that's probably one of my favorite um, and then also um, Andrew Jackson um, and Rachel Jackson um, had a grape salad recipe that I, I really like that one too that's great. Um, I think Minji has a couple of questions um, about the percentage of women who who were going to college in 1920s. I'm so Do nervous. You know? Sorry, it's a number of questions. <laughs> so um, basically, I wanted to ask because ah, in, your, I see. 
in Europe, it's like um, 1920s was between First World War and Second World War. I was just wondering how it was in the United States during 1920s, especially women's life, were they expected to just be a housewife or did majority of them go to work, go to college? Like that, that's the question. Um, yeah, um, that's a great question. The, the 1920s, and which is one of the really fun um, things about that time period, um, it's actually in 2020, of course, it was exactly 100 years um, anniversary for um, women just getting the right to vote, uh, which is interesting because um, that was here in Tennessee as well. It was a, a Tennessee senator who cast the deciding vote to grant that to women um, in August of 1920, but it was really um, a time of a lot of change. So um, most women were still um, considered to want to be a housewife or that was sort of more of the norm, but there was also several women who were really branching out from that and kind of, you know, dressing a little bit differently and again, bobbing their hair, um, going to college, but it was relatively rare for them to have attended college, especially um, since Grace Coolidge went even before 1920 to college. So um, that was definitely rare um, for women, but starting a, in the 1920s, it was kind of moving to, you know, some women were working and, and things like that. Um, and then, uh, especially in uh, World War II um, in the 40s, um, all, almost all the women were, you know, it's kind of going to work and taking over with, you know, the men not being around. So they were working in different factories and things like that. I hope that helps. Great answer. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, we have one more question. Have you ever met with any of the living first ladies? <laughs> no, I would <laughs> love to. That would be really cool. Um, uh, let's hope that uh, maybe someday um, that I might be able to meet with them, uh, or at least one of them. Um, like I said, when I do Rosalind Carter next month, I'm a little bit nervous because, of course, she is still alive. Um, so. I'm hoping uh, that I don't, you know, offend her or something. But um, yeah, no, I haven't met with any of them. I would love to. And um, fingers crossed that that happens someday. Anybody has yes, any questions? I am sure too. Yes. <laughs> we will make sure that your message passed to the White House. So, you know, I think they would definitely want to invite you to the White House. <laughs> I would hope, I would hope so. <laughs> do you have any other questions? So if we got time, I, I do have more questions. Uh, I, I mean, for, for the president of United States, there would be more or less a kind of like a job description, what they are expect to do, what like their, their responsibilities day in and day out. Do first ladies actually have such description of what they are expected, what their responsibility is, or they can more or less freely define who they are? Mm, for, and also for, I think for the current uh, Biden's wife, for the first current first wife, she, she's a teacher. I wonder if she, she's still teaching or that do they have to give up their full-time job as soon as the, the, the husband becomes the president? Yes, um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, in regards to current first lady, Dr. Joe Biden, yeah, she's actually, um, I believe she's come out and said that she is still going to work, um, that she's not gonna give up her job. Um, it's been it's been different all through the, you know, starting from, you know, Martha Washington all the way to now. Um, you would see some, especially back in the day, um, 1800s, that sort of thing, they really didn't have a very much of a role. They were sort of just the wife of the president. They didn't, weren't expected to do much, you know, but as time has moved forward, um, they're, they, they do have a more defined job description. Um, sort of, um, how do I say it? Um, they're sort of expected to um, 
host certain things, be a you know different type, you know, in that capacity. And you know, they just they kind of become more important um, as a symbol um, as time has gone on, I guess. Um, especially starting as you got into the 1900s, and and as you saw when when women kind of had more freedom to do things, um, then they were able to kind of speak out, have their own platforms uh, for different policies and uh, sort of like they would pick, you know, different causes and that they were able to like advocate for those different things. So it has, it's changed a lot over the years, so. Yeah, because uh, we, we do grow up reading 